good morning, everyone. Thank you. Um, thank you for joining us and joining our webinar. I am just going to share a screen as well. So, um, so, so Pete, Peter, um, Peter Little has walked us through some of the economic consequences of what we've seen, some of the sectors that have really come under a lot of pressure, and talked about the Chinese recovery and what we can learn from that. It now falls to myself and after me, Peter Armitage, to start to distill from that, what does that actually mean for investments? What, what do we think um, people should be looking at right now? So to do that, I'm going to um, walk through um, just four slides. Um, I've just come off a roadshow or come off a roadshow in February when, when I was still allowed out. And the key theme to the roadshow that I was presenting was that central banks will do whatever it takes to keep assets uh, asset prices um, stable, to actually keep investments relatively stable and look after risk investments. I'm going to expand on that in a few minutes and outline what's happened. Thereafter, I'm going to talk about what that means for the US interest rates, for South African interest rates, and the RAND. Looking, looking at the, the markets, I think Peter Little had a chart up a few minutes ago where he said, we saw four weeks where there was a significant sell down of asset prices, down, down by about 34%. And thereafter, it, we've seen about a 20% recovery, potentially a bit more depending on the asset class you look at. What has happened? And really two things have happened. The first is, you know, this, this um, crisis came, came out of nowhere. We didn't have data. We didn't have models. And the initial models we were seeing were actually quite horrific. What I mean by that is the World Bank, for example, put out a report which estimated that up to 37 million people could die from COVID. That is absolutely horrific. As, as time has progressed, we've got more data, our models have become better, and we've started to model the, um, the crisis with, with more accuracy. And the most horrific scenarios, 37 million people, people aren't talking about that anymore. And we're now talking about potentially 100,000, a couple of hundred thousand people. It is still a significant and tragic loss of life, but it's not the catastrophe that we're talking about. So what has happened is that over time, as we've understood this, um, what was very bad has become less bad, and the markets were in the markets a little bit of comfort, and as a result, we've seen you know the financial markets recover somewhat. The other aspect of what's going on within our within our markets is that um, the central banks have certainly stepped up. Peter Little had a slide a few minutes ago where he was, talk, where he was talking about significant stimulus from, from the US economy. I'm going to unpack that, as you can see on the slide, in a few seconds. And then I'm going to talk about South Africa per se. If we look at financial market stimulus, it really comes in two forms. So what, what we've got is what I term financial market support. That is basically where the US Federal Reserve, the US Treasury, step in and start buying financial assets. They buy um, bonds, they buy ETFs these days, they buy asset-backed securities, and they've all got a whole host of programs that I list there to, to basically support the Federal Reserve buying financial assets. If, if we look at that, that has put about $3.7 trillion of support into financial markets. That's about 18% of GDP in the US that they have spent actually just supporting their financial markets. That is the other reason for the significant recovery that we have seen of late. The other type of support that we are seeing is more your SMME support. It's the support for the mom and pop shops, the smaller businesses out there. And in the US that's come in two forms. It's come in the form of a CARES Act, which basically transfers cash down to another number of companies. It's a reduced taxation. It's actually <clears throat> um, massive support for these companies. And then it's come in the form of a payroll protection program. Basically, um, small companies can go and borrow money um, to enable them to pay um, wages in, in the States. Combination of those two programs is about 13% of GDP. Put another way, the US response to this has been to take 30% of their GDP and invest it back into their economy to buoy, um, to buoy their, um, their economy and to, to work their way through the crisis. Looking at what Peter Little said about Europe, if you remember where his dots were, on average, European, um, European states have invested about 4% of their GDP. So they have invested significantly less than the US. 
Talk about South Africa for a moment. And if we were to invest 30% of South Africa's GDP into our economy, that's about 900 billion rand of support. It's just not. But the good news is that South Africa is not the US. And what I mean by that is if you think about the US, when a corporate wants to borrow money, it goes to the bond market, it'll go to the syndicated loan market, it'll go to the loan market, and it'll borrow in the professional markets. In South Africa, when most corporates want to borrow money, they actually just go to the bank. That's actually quite an important distinction because for South Africa to spend 20% of its GDP on quantitative easing to stimulate the bond market is absolutely um, ridiculous because South African corporates don't borrow in the bond market. They're not going to benefit from the nominal bond market um, at all. Therefore, what we actually need to do is say, if we want to provide liquidity, if we want to make sure that banks have access to cash, or sorry, that corporates have access to cash, we need to do it through the banking system because that's how South Africans um, structurally borrow. So what have we done then? We've increased the liquidity um, of, <clears throat> of our banks with specific liquidity injections from, from the Reserve Bank. We've actually seen the Reserve Bank loosen up regulatory capital requirements, again, freeing up significant amounts of capital that banks can then um, apply towards supporting the corporate sector. And we've seen um, the Reserve Bank take a, a temporary lenient, lenient stance on some accounting interpretations, again, giving the banks flexibility to actually support the corporate sector. So from that perspective, yes, the US had to spend a lot of money buying their corporate bond market to keep the flow of cash going in the economy. We've been able to do that in the South African environment with, within our banking system. And actually, um, it's pr looking pretty good at the moment. So I'm, I'm feeling more confident that our program size has been appropriate there. In terms of SMME support, unfortunately, this is where we fall a bit short. So SMME support of 13% would still be three, 390 billion rand of support for South African corporates. We're, we have not given anywhere near that amount of cash to, to companies and to households to, to survive. What we have done though is we've, we've heard from the Solidarity Fund, um, which has got a humanitarian effort as part of its um, activities. We've, we've got other funds that have been discussed as well. On top of that, we've seen um, some significant um, interest rate cuts. I think some of the most significant interest rate cuts that South Africa's ever seen. Those interest rate cuts in and of themselves actually put about 90 billion Rand back into consumers' pockets. So from that perspective, there have been very, very significant actions taking place. And if we go and add up the value of all of those actions, South Africa's um, support has been about 4% of GDP. In line with Europe, less than the US, and bear in mind the sub-Saharan African region's average is about 0.8% of GDP. So we've actually done a reasonable amount as well. Unfortunately, there is a recession coming. We're starting it now. As Peter said, it's going to take a while to work through the system, but we are going to get to the other side of that. So what does that mean for financial assets? In terms of how we look at financial assets, I've got a chart here which shows the yield on the US 10-year bond. And you can see how the interest rate on the US 10-year bond was around about 3% almost two years ago. It was gradually drifting downwards anyway. And as we got to the COVID crisis, the yield on the bond dropped. I contrast that with the dark line or the dotted line or the lighter blue line, which shows anchor goes and we look at fundamental values of assets. We look at um, growth rates. We put these all into our model. We say, what is our model fair value of the yield? So yes, the market might be pricing it at one level, but anchor thinks the fair price is something different. You can see how our model fair value of the yield has dropped quite significantly. The interesting question when you look at US bonds is at the moment, the 10-year bond is yielding 0.7%. That is actually quite an anomaly these days. Developed market bonds outside of the US are basically um, yielding negative interest rates. German bonds are yielding negative interest rates. Japanese bonds are yielding negative interest rates or zero. And yet, for some reason, interest rates in the US are positive. Why is that? And what the bond market is basically telling you is that the US economy is going to recover and once we've been through this dip, it's probably going to recover towards a trend GDP growth rate of about one and a half percent again. So it's, it's basically saying that this is a temporary thing. We're not at the moment in the assessment of the bond market going into you know, this permanent L-shaped um, economic slowdown. 
but that as 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 economic activity picks up, um, you know, once once we're through the virus, um, that there's actually significant recovery um, coming throughout the globe. So from that perspective, I think the bond market is actually giving a positive message. If I look at South African bonds, we've seen quite the opposite happen. So again, I've got a chart with the actual yield on bonds, and you can see it's the jagged line as, as the R186 bond, the government's benchmark bond, um, trades and actually traded in a nice range for a long period. And as the COVID crisis hit, the yield on the bonds shot upwards, quite marked. Against that, you've got our model of the fair value of the bonds. And again, you can see the moves around a bit as global factors change. Right at the end here, you can actually see we got downgraded by Moody's, we've be become a junk rated nation by all three rating agencies. And on the right hand side, you can see we've actually increased our fair yield by, by about 1% on the bond. That actually would tie nicely with historic um, adjustments that you've seen in sort of credit spreads when, when countries have gone um, to junk. What has happened in South Africa has significantly outstripped that. Basically, we saw a situation where um, as the COVID crisis became, became real to us, Foreign, foreigners sold all risk assets and they sold particularly um, strongly out of emerging markets. So we've seen a massive emerging market, a pullback from emerging markets and a number of bonds being sold into South Africa um, very quickly. That has put our bond and our financial system under strain. The Reserve Bank has now acted to, um, to actually repair, the, um, to repair this. But, whoops, but where we're at, is that the bond yields are still materially above what we think a fair yield is for South Africa, notwithstanding the downgrade. And that gives us an opportunity. We think that this is a, still a good opportunity for investors to lock in South African interest rates that are at a total premium to what they could earn anywhere else in the world and actually at a total premium for the risks that they're actually taking. So we continue to see good value in the bond markets at the Finally, I just want to look at the South African RAND. Looking at the RAND, what we've got is uh, South Af the anchor um, buys into the PPP, Purchasing Power Parity Model, which says that the value of the RAND should depreciate by the inflation differential between South Africa and the US over time. What we do is we graph that blue line, which is our PPP model estimate over time, and you can see it's a nice gentle gradient of depreciation. Against that, we've now got the red line, which is the actual value of the RAND over time. And you can see at the end there um, in October, or it doesn't quite line up, but in March, how the, um, how the RAND has spiked significantly weaker, setting an all-time record of 19.35 to the dollar, the weakest the RAND has ever been. That was also the most stretched in history that the RAND has been against our um, PPP model. So... If we look at this, what we will say is there is a fair value to the RAND. The RAND is probably worth about $15 um, right now. And, you know, looking through the um, crisis in 2002, looking through the crisis in um, 2016, um, you can see that the RAND does tend to come back. We think that that will be the case again. We do think that there's some recovery from the RAND, for the RAND. We've seen some of that recovery already. We will see more of it in due course. With yesterday's interest rate cut, um, the interest rate differential between South Africa and, and the US declined because interest rates are 1% lower. That means that the, um, the carry trade, which, which tends to result in the sharp snapbacks of, of the RAND towards fair value, is, is less likely to occur, it's less appealing. So as, as we cut interest rates through this crisis, which I think we may well cut again, um, probably another 50 basis points, what you will see is that um, it means that the RAND's recovery is still there. I think the fair value is still 15. It's just going to be a slightly more protracted recovery as a consequence of, um, of the interest rate cuts. But certainly, um, you know, our perspective right now is, is that, um, you know, the RAND is oversold and we'd be cautious of externalizing money at today's level.